let's talk a little bit about muscle contraction. I'm going to use an analogy, and in this analogy, let me get a highlighter here. Let's see, laser pointer. In this analogy, I represent troponin. Troponin are these proteins here that are attached to a, a longer fibrous protein called tropomycin. And this actin, these are proteins called actin. And this is represents my daughter. I actually have two daughters. One's 22 and one's six, so I have them spread out. These myosin heads over here, they represent their boyfriend. And my goal is to cover up and prevent these myosin heads from interacting with the actin sites here physically to contract, contract the muscle in this case. So I wanted to kind of show you what role everything is. And um, there's only one thing that will cause me to move out of the way. And I'll show it at the top, this next one. So troponin is here. This is a protein. And when a wedding ring is shown to me, I will move out of the way and reveal these, these um, myosin binding sites so that the myosin heads and the actin can interact. And I just don't want to know any details about it. But uh, calcium represents that wedding ring. So when calcium binds to troponin or is presented to me, then troponin will move tropomycin out of the way and allow interaction with the myosin heads. Now this happens whenever a, ner a motor neuron sends an impulse to the muscle for it to contract. Inside the muscle cell, you have sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it, it has just a lot of calcium pumped into it, and when the impulse comes, it'll release that calcium, and the calcium will go find troponin and bind to it and move it out of the way so that you can have a muscle contraction where the muscle shortens. Let's talk about some things that can go wrong. Well, one thing I wanted to mention first is that you have different, you have three different types of troponin proteins, and uh, two of them in particular, troponin I and troponin T. It's called troponin T because it actually attaches to tropomycin here, and uh, then you have troponin I and you have troponin C. But these two on the outside, troponin I and troponin T, they're cardio specific. So we know our our heart has a myocardium. So it has a lot of muscle cells. And whenever you have a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, some of these cells die. And when they die, the cells kind of lice where they open up and they will release these troponins into the bloodstream. And if you take the blood of someone who's suspected to have had a, a MI, then even within three to four hours, it'll you know, you'll see this elevated and it will remain elevated for 10 to 14 days. So it can really uh, key in the clinician as to whether or not the patient has had a heart attack or not and what treatment to follow. Another pathology that's seen in muscle is uh, caused by a bacterium. This bacterium is called Clostridium botulinum. So Clostridium is the genus name and botulinum is the species name, kind of like Homo sapiens. Homo is the genus, sapiens is the species. Uh, this, this bacteria, what it's known for is if someone, pour, they, they're anaerobic and they can produce toxin in poorly canned foods. A lot of times it happens when people try to can them at home, not as much commercial. And uh, these toxins get into the intestines, and we have smooth muscle in our intestines. And this is kind of an ingenious way for this bacteria to hang around and in the intestines longer. It, one way we get rid of bacteria in our intestines that are harmful is we have diarrhea that flushes it out. Well, in this case, this bacteria gets in there and it releases a toxin called Botox toxin that will cause the smooth muscle that causes the peristalsis to push everything out of the intestines, it paralyzes it. 
so that bacteria can just marinate in there longer and do what it does. But uh, we actually use this toxin medically for several purposes. I have one patient that his toes would curl up to the point where he had trouble walking. He just would have these constant spasms in his toes. And so they would inject Botox into his toes every three months and it would cause the muscles to relax and let the toes kind of spread out. Sometimes when patients have, I've also had patients that were having migraines and uh, we would get them Botox injections at the base of their skull where you have some suboccipital muscles that can really tense up and cause, be the source of some migraines and so that will cause those to paralyze basically and relax. You probably heard of Botox toxin for wrinkles. You know, if you have wrinkles in your forehead or around your eyes, you can inject some Botox every three months and it will cause the muscle, little muscles in that area to relax and it will cause the, the skin to spread out. And my wife contributes a lot of money in this area, even though she doesn't need it, but that's a side, little side thing. But how does it work? So at the neuromuscular junction, this is where the motor neuron meets the muscle. We always have a one, one neurotransmitter that is released here. It's called acetylcholine. And it's made up in the cell body of the, the neuron. And it travels down to the end of it, down its axon to the end of it, in vesicles. And these vesicles will, uh, if they're healthy, will merge or with the membrane through exocytosis and release the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft where it can bind to acetylcholine receptors in the muscle cell membrane called the sarcolemma. So if you give someone Botox toxin, it actually cleaves and um, causes this protein that snags, snares, it's called a snare protein, so we'll say it snares the vesicle so it can attach to the cell membrane uh, this gets cleaved off and, and dysfunctional, so it, those vesicles have no way of merging with the cell membrane. So basically you get paralysis of that muscle because it's not getting stimulated by the, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Um, and it takes about three months to make all new vesicles, so that's, that's why uh, after these snare proteins have done their thing, uh, it takes a couple months for them to recover and this process to work again. So it's always temporary when you use uh, toxin medically, botulism toxin medically. Another disease you can have that involves muscles is another one that's at the neuromuscular junction, and this one's called myasthenia gravis. Anytime you see MY or MYO, it's going to involve muscle. So myasthenia gravis is where the patient will have symptoms of just generalized weakness. They fatigue really quickly. You could have them move their arm up and down 20 times and then it would fatigue. Or you could have them blink, you know, 20 times and their eyelids would kind of droop, which is called ptosis. And uh, you, know, you can imagine what will, what happens here is you have an autoimmune disease, so you have antibodies that will bind to the receptor, the acetylcholine receptors. They're called nicotinic receptors because the nicotine from cigarette smoke also, or from cigarettes, also attach to these receptors. But this antibody will go and de destroy these uh, acetylcholine receptors, these nicotinic receptors, and it may destroy as many as a half to two thirds of them. So uh, what you get is less activation of the muscle and, and how that manifests clinically is weakness. So how do we treat a patient with myasthenia gravis? How can we get a better interaction between that acetylcholine and the acetylcholine receptors, the nicotinic receptors? Well, let's look at this first. So what happens is after a, a short time, you, you wouldn't want a muscle to always contract. You'd be in a, you know, like a, it'd be like you're in a seizure or something. So these acetylcholine esterase, you see the ACE suffix, which tells you it's an enzyme. So it's a protein that comes in 
and cleans out the acetylcholine shortly after it's released so that you just get a transient or short uh, interaction there. Well, there's medications out there called acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And what they'll do is they'll go and they'll, in they'll inhibit that enzyme from taking out the acetylcholine. So the, you, the receptors that you have available, you have more interaction. So it happens so quick where the acetylcholine is released that even uh, when you only have a third of your receptors available, only a portion of those interact with the acetylcholine. But if it's out there in the synaptic cleft longer, it will interact and uh, bind to these acetylcholine receptors and get all the ones that are available and you get a stronger muscle contraction out of that. So an example of acetylcholine esterase inhibitor is called neostigmine. They, all, they can also use uh, immunosuppressants such as prednisone to just try to decrease the number of, uh, of these antibodies that are produced by plasma cells. Or um, they've even started to use rituximab and some other monoclonal antibodies to try to target um, this this action. So hope you enjoyed that and I'll catch you on the next video.